In this, the year of our Lord 2025, Italian scientists did the most Italian thing ever, and they invented a new way to boil an egg. You want to try it? Let's try it. It's called periodic cooking. It's by these uh, researchers mostly out of Naples, and uh, their work is inspired by the whole sous vide egg thing. A sous vide egg is uh, not wrapped in plastic. <laughs> you know, the egg already comes wrapped. A sous vide egg is when you take an egg and you just drop it in some water with your immersion circulator that came with your sous vide kit, and you hold that water and the egg at a modest temperature for a really long time, like 45 minutes at, you know, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be like 65 Celsius. It gets you this really creamy, semi-solid yolk. The problem is that the white is also semi-solid, a little bit liquidy, which people usually don't like, right? As the scientists point out here, only one of the many kinds of protein that are found in the white will actually uh, coagulate at these temperatures. The rest will just stay liquid. So to get that creamy yolk, effect, but also with a solid white, they did a whole bunch of like mathematical modeling and other really intense stuff to work out a procedure, which is basically a uh, right there. You take the egg, you boil it for two minutes, then you take it out and you transfer it to water that's basically at room temperature, a little bit north of room temperature. You put it in that water to cool down for two minutes, then you transfer it back to the boiling water for two minutes, and then back to the cooler water for two minutes, and you repeat for 32 total minutes. I've done this before with a single egg and a slotted spoon. Obviously, that was incredibly labor intensive. If we're gonna do this at all, we wanna do it with a larger volume of eggs. So I've got half a dozen eggs here in a sieve that I can kind of dip in and out of the two vessels. We'll see if that works. Okay, we'll gently submerge our eggs in there. Okay, 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 I think we're in. And then uh, the best way to time this is to use a, a stopwatch with a lap timer, which you might recognize back from your, your high school track days if you did that. I'm keeping it covered because uh, I have a really weak gas stove, and if I don't keep it covered, my water temperature tends to dip below the 100 degrees Celsius that the uh, researchers used for their experiment and to perfect the method. So here we are coming up on the, the second lap. Lap, two minutes, okay. And we go gently to the nice cool water to cool off for a little while. All right, next two minute lap is over. Hit the lap button, transfer back on over to the hot water and we repeat for 32 total minutes, remember? What we're doing here is heating the outside of the egg that transfers heat inside the egg, but before the very dead center of the egg where the yolk lives gets too hot, what we do is we pull the egg out, we put it in the comparatively cooler water to cool everything back down again, and then we repeat. And this way we slowly cook the white without letting too much heat penetrate into the dead center where the yolk is. Two minutes, lap. Or obviously, until somebody invents a machine that can follow this exact temperature curve automatically, this is not going to be like something that I do every day in order to uh, make protein to feed myself. No, for that, I go to a Factor, sponsor of this video. Legit, especially now that I'm training regularly in the gym again, I want my fresh protein and vegetables in my belly at prescribed intervals. And I'm not gonna cook every one of those meals myself. I have other things to do. Factor is owned by Hello Fresh, which has supported the channel for years, you know. The meals are fresh, not frozen when they arrive at your doorstep, and there's no chopping or anything. You just heat them up. Ooh, they sent some extras. Lauren's got the carrot ginger juice. Wow. Wow. That's like, that's surprisingly delicious. The meals are hot in a couple of minutes, and no joke, I would do a video about whatever method they are using to produce the most consistently juicy chicken breast I have ever had that was not cooked to order. And I got my cauliflower rice there, the green beans still have a lot of snap to them, shockingly delicious, and dietitian approved. Take all the stress and much of the expense out of feeding yourself like a grown-up every day. Let Factor handle that, at least some of the time. They've got vegan meal plans, low-cal, lots of options. Hit my link in the description or go to factor75.com. Use my code 50ragusia to get 50% off plus free shipping on your first Factor box. That's 50% off with code 50ragusia. Thank you, Factor. Anyway, the new mathematically modeled method for producing a perfect boiled egg. Two minutes in each bath. And I'm using uh, as much water as possible in both baths, especially this one, um, to uh, prevent the eggs from heating this water up 
too much higher beyond the target temperature, right? Because now the hot eggs, uh, that energy is being distributed across a whole lot of water molecules because I started with a pretty large thing of water. Like I said, I have eaten one of these newfangled boiled eggs before. Is it worth it? Is, uh, uh, maybe now it is when egg prices have skyrocketed and we should probably be treating our eggs with a little bit more respect. Hey, why are eggs suddenly so expensive in the United States? It's really, really important. And while we're doing this, I think we should talk about that. U.S. egg producers have since 2022 uh, been dealing with an outbreak of avian influenza, bird flu. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's really bad among domestic chickens. And the chickens that we raise for meat have been affected by bird flu, but not nearly as much as the chickens that we raise to lay eggs, the egg laying hens. Hens are kept in uh, different kinds of facilities. They, they live to be older than the chickens that we raise for meat. Nobody knows why they're, they're more likely to be affected by bird flu, but they are. And we had another uh, spike in the outbreak starting in the uh, last summer, late last summer. And when a hen house has some bird flu in it, you just have to kill all the hens. There's no other way to stop it. So in the last few months, U.S. egg producers have had to put down something like 15% of their egg laying hens. So there's fewer eggs on the market, especially in certain areas. And uh, people panic buy when that happens. They buy out all the eggs and there's no eggs in the store. So the stores raise the prices to discourage people from clearing out all of the eggs, or you could call it price gouging, I suppose it's a little bit of both. And for some reason, states that have laws encouraging uh, so-called cage-free egg production have seen uh, slightly higher rates of bird flu, like in California, slightly higher rates of bird flu. Nobody knows why. It may be that those states are just more on the migratory bird routes where migratory birds are bringing the virus with them. What we do know is that uh, bird flu can spread to cattle and it has. Now I've seen a whole lot of like viral rage bait content on the internet where people are blaming the spread of bird flu from birds to cattle on the fact that some cattle in the United States do eat a uh, feed that has chicken litter in it, chicken droppings and little bits of feathers and ground up dead chicken and stuff. It's one of these things that like definitely sounds gross just because something sounds gross doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad practice and I don't wanna weigh in on that practice right now. I will say that normally the kind of chicken litter that they put into animal feed uh, is pasteurized and therefore it shouldn't have any germs in it. They pasteurize it by uh, stacking it where you just take the, the litter and you kind of pile it up on itself like a mulch pile so that you know the fermentation all the different exothermic chemical breakdown reactions that happen inside the pile create heat, and that heat kind of spreads through the whole pile. It sits at an elevated temperature for a long time. It pasteurizes. It kills all the germs, theoretically. We don't know how bird flu got to cattle. What we do know is that um, the way that bird flu is spreading among cattle is mostly through milk. There's a lot of the virus in the milk of an infected cow, and it seems to be getting spread from uh, via milking equipment, right? So it's not even really a, a beef thing in the U.S. right now. It's, it's it's really a dairy thing. Lap. And uh, yes, people do also get bird flu. It's usually workers who are working in close contact with the birds and not using sufficient personal protective gear. Uh, a few dozen cases in the United States in the last year or so, and uh, one known death. Bird flu isn't something that like the average person really needs to freak out about yet. It's just something where I'm really glad that we have scientists and public health officials keeping their eye on it. Unfortunately, their work is getting much more difficult these days, and we also need to talk about that. We have a new uh, presidential administration in the United States right now, and that administration is currently making, or uh, at least contemplating, major, major, major cuts to uh, publicly funded science here in the U.S. Now, it's important to acknowledge that the president and his advisors have stated reasons for doing this. Their stated position is that the American scientific establishment, which is significantly funded by taxpayer dollars, um, doesn't use the taxpayer's dollar wisely and also engages in a lot of research that is uh, driven by um, controversial political motives, right? To that, I say... Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I've known a lot of people in my life in universities and outside of universities, and everybody tends to be at least a little bit careless and uh, wasteful with somebody else's money. I also find that most human beings have a political agenda of some kind. But we have to ask ourselves, what do we think will make that problem worse or better. Just like the solution to bad speech is usually more speech, the solution to bad science is more science. And I think we're heading into a world where there's going to be a lot less science, and that scares me. Under the direction of the new administration, the National Institute of Health, NIH, announced on Friday that they were going to start 
capping what are called indirect research costs at 15%. That is a huge deal, and please let me try to explain why. Okay, when you get a grant to do some science from the government, they give you some money to go do an experiment or something, you're supposed to use all of it for direct costs. That's like the test tubes that you're using and the, you know, the virus samples that you buy to study the disease that you're studying or whatever it is you do. That's the direct cost. Then they also give you an additional percentage of of your grant above that, like 15, 20, 30, 50, 60 percent for what they call indirect costs, which is usually like overhead, it's the facility, it's the lab and all the people who run the lab. Some grant applicants only need about 15% for indirect costs because, you know, it's a small independent lab doing a small little study. There just isn't that much that they need beyond their own time and effort and their computer. But let's just say that you're like a cancer researcher who needs an experimental nuclear reactor to generate like the neutrons that you need in order to do your work. You're not going to do that at a teeny little lab. For that, you need to go to MIT or to my alma mater, Penn State, where they have experimental nuclear reactors. Extraordinarily expensive installations with enormous overhead costs associated with them. That's one of the big reasons why people do their research at a university, because they need those kinds of like hardcore facilities resources. And that stuff just costs more. So uh, indirect costs going to a university will often be 60% not 15. Speaking of numbers, we've hit our 32 minutes, and so it's time for these to come on out. And actually, they need to cool down in uh, cool running water. This is pretty warm water. Yeah, so universities generally want and get much higher indirect costs for their government uh, research grants from NIH. Now, what do they do with that money? Do, do like the big time university fat cats just kind of line their own feather beds with that money? Well, uh, as someone who's had a number of uh, bad run-ins with university administrators in my career, I can tell you I'm sympathetic to that interpretation, but I don't really think that that's what's going on. Um, I used to have to participate in an annual grant review process as part of my old job at a university, and let me tell you, it's like pulling teeth. It's like having the most intimate parts of your body examined. You have to account for every single cent that you have spent. Also, universities generally are already subsidizing the research that goes on there to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. That's on top of the money that the government is giving them through these indirect uh, cost grants. So yeah, as of this week, new and existing NIH grants, the indirect costs are capped at 15%. This is going to absolutely decimate the scientific research system that we take for granted here in the United States. The system that has produced the science that underlies all of the technologies, the miraculous technologies that we take for granted every day. This is where that came from. Now, it's also been reported that the new administration plans to lay off about half of the people who work at the National Science Foundation and to cut the budget there by about two-thirds. Now let's say that you're a person who thinks that health science is compromised, that like big pharma does not want to cure our diseases anymore, they just want to get us hooked on expensive pills for the rest of our lives. You know what? I'm kind of sympathetic to that worldview too. I think there's a lot of legitimate complaint there. However, this move of defunding public science in the U.S., this is going to make that problem so much worse, not better. Because these are the grants that pay for like basic research. If you've got an idea for a pill that's going to make billions of dollars, you don't need a government grant for that. You go to a government grant when, like, you just want to try to understand something about how these different subatomic particles interact, and you don't know if it's going to kind of lead to a revolutionary new technology or anything. You just want to try to understand it a little bit better. That's what government science is really valuable for, especially the kind that goes to universities, because the universities have the, like, particle accelerators and stuff that are necessary to do that kind of research. And yeah, it costs money, more than 15%. I mean, think of all the brilliant scientists who fled Central Europe in the 1930s when they and their work became politically unpopular. Countries like the United States took them in in droves, and we gave them grants, and they produced science that gave us, like, the internet and nuclear power and all kinds of incredible things. Nations that invest in science invest in their future. So... If you like me and my videos, my guess is you're a curious person who likes the fact that there are scientists working on your behalf to learn about your world for you. Here's something that I need you to do. I'm asking you to do a favor for your old buddy Goose. And listen, if you are um, someone who voted for the current administration in the United States,
States, I need you most of all because your voice is going to be heard louder than anybody else's. If you need it, there's a link in the description where you can find out how to call your representatives in Congress. Call them, leave a message, and if you're a Republican and or a Trump voter, please do tell them that and tell them that, you know, I support the president and I support him doing this, I support him doing that. I just don't want to cut science. I think that we need to keep investing in science as a nation to invest in ourselves. Tell your representatives that you support publicly funded science because publicly funded science is at the foundations of American prosperity today as we know it. I really, really am not eager to get this explicitly political in a video here on my channel. The fact that I'm doing it should I hope to communicate to you how seriously I take this and how important I think this is. I don't want to do this, I'm doing it anyway because I think that we gotta. All right, let's go ahead and uh, crack and peel these eggs, which I'm not very good at. Oh, go birds, by the way. Uh, I wore this during the Super Bowl instead of my Chris Jones shirt, and I think that's why the Eagles beat the Chiefs. Let's go ahead and uh, cut this baby, see what that yolk looks like. Oh, ho, ho, ho. All right, I think I overcooked it a little bit this time, but it's still got that nice kind of jelly-like texture in it. I right, know if you think that you don't like plain boiled eggs, I would suggest that maybe the reason is that you haven't uh, put crunchy salt on them. You got to put crunchy salt on there and uh... mm. It is a better way to cook an egg, I'm not gonna lie. Call your congressmen and your senators, especially if you're a Republican or a Trump voter. They're gonna listen to you more. Say that you ride for science. Oh hey, update as of uh, editing time, a federal judge in Boston has temporarily paused this decrease in the uh, indirect cost rate cap. And I don't know if the Trump administration is going to abide by that ruling. They have not abided by other rulings and that's a thing that's going on right now. Yes. Adam also has concerns about other things that the Trump administration is doing. I'm choosing to focus on funding for science right now because I think that that's something that our entire community here can get behind. And uh, politics necessarily involves acting on whatever common ground you can find with the other people who share your world with you. And we don't generally get to choose who we share our world with unless we're willing to uh, commit mass murder. And I think you would agree that we should all try to minimize that. And hey, look, if you're on my side here and you want to try to preserve funding for science, please be careful about how you engage in the comments on this one. Let's not needlessly alienate people who could join us in this particular effort. Do you want to be right or do you want to fix the problem?